Cardinal. All right, the chamber pressure looks good. Probably not. Roger, Roger, Roger. Water towers fly! Yes! Ego down phenomenal. Water down phenomenal. Water down phenomenal. Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these. All right, folks, you know the drill. Let me know if you can see me and hear what I'm saying. I see the little volume bar jumping. That's usually a good sign. I see people in chat dancing to the music. I don't know how you dance to the music in chat, but I'm sure you all will figure it out. John Galloway with NASA Space Flight here with another Virtual Astronomy Live show. It's the old combined thing that we do once a month with Intrepid Museums, Virtual Astronomy Live, and we mix it in with an NSF Live that happens on Sundays, and it's just a big party, and space fans show up, and Kenneth knows how to dance in chat, apparently. Thank you, Kenneth. Let's make sure that we are all good to go here. And, uh, oh, brother. <laughs> good times. Good times. That's what's going to happen. Chat, how are we now? Let me know if everything's clicking the way it should be clicking now. We should see the stream live in all the places. Let me know. This is why I always wait to make sure it confirmed that it went through. I think we're good, though. I'll sing the song for you. Okay, we already did that on the other channels, but uh, maybe I'll play it for you all in the outro. How's that? Water towers can fly. Yeah, yeah, because you bet can concur. You all know how it goes. <laughs> okay, fine. I'll bring Elisa's camera on. Jeez, you'll hang out just a second. Which she's laughing at you now. Um, we are ready to go here, and I apparently did not wait for confirmation that the stream was live. I'm sending it to like 15 places. <sighs> and one place it didn't make it to. But it's there now. I'm getting lots of 5 by 5s in chat, which is fantastic. And it is time for us to do the whole combined Intrepid Virtual Astronomy Live, NSF Live sort of thing. John Das Galloway, whatever you want to call me here today, doing the pre-show in about 30, 25 minutes, we'll have some of the folks that are actually on the James Webb Space Telescope team joining us to talk about the James, James Webb Space Telescope images. Say that 15 times fast. Uh, that is actually a tongue twister. And no, YouTube, now is not a good time to insert ads. Close. I'm not inserting ads right now. Good. Uh, anyways, that's the score for today. We're going to have a little bit of a pre-show here. Alicia Seagull with Intrepid Museum is going to be joining us in just a second, talking about ghosts or something. I don't know. I'm sure she'll fill us in on what she's going to talk about. But uh, in the meantime, or right after that, I guess, we're going to have special guests from the James Webb team. So that's sort of the thing here. It's a virtual show. We've got people dialing into Zoom calls or whatever. Um, we're going to be doing live Q&A. So if you've watched me do shows before, you know that I sort of read chat and uh, everything seems to be coming through chat. And then I pick some things that qualify from chat and we will be asking some questions. So when we get over to the James Webb segment, make sure you ask some questions in chat if you ever wanted to ask a question straight to the James Webb Space Telescope team. That's coming up in about 24 minutes now. But to get started here with the pre-show, let me find the right thing to click. I think it's this one. I don't know. Let's see here. The entire chat is just chanting Elysia here. So let's go ahead and turn Elysia's camera on. Elysia Seagull, Public Programs, Intrepid Museum, how you doing? Hey, okay, can you hear me? I need some five by fives. Can you hear me? <laughs> I don't know. I can hear you. Chat, can you all awesome. hear her? Awesome. Excellent. We, we need to turn her you up guys or are we good? so funny. Oh my God. I'm reading this chat and I'm losing my mind. You're amazing. <laughs> I love you all. <laughs> so, um, yeah, go ahead. What's the plan here? You were going to tell us about some topic that I had trouble pronouncing, I think. Yeah, you know, I'm, <laughs> everyone thinks I'm talking about ghosts. I don't know how that rumor got started. <laughs> That's I will admit like. there are actually going to be some ghosts in the first image that I will show you here, um, but not the type <laughs> you're thinking of. If you follow me on social, you might have seen that I did go ghost hunting actually two nights ago. Um, I was helping out with an overnight that we had at the Intrepid Museum. This is related. Uh -huh. um, and I did bring my EMF detectors. Yes, I have those. Uh, and we were doing some ghost hunting around the ship, which was this really is, cool. I'm like diving for your socials here, uh, trying to find, because you tweeted that yesterday and it was the I weirdest did, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't type your name fast though I have to type your name slowly yeah but that has nothing to do with no it brain. does it's <laughs> look this is what the pre-show is about this is like it where is. you run around with a detector detecting ghosts or strange <laughs> phenomenon isn't it's, it no okay so 
let's let's dive into this pre-show shall we just so we can get this out of the way <laughs> this month's astronomy live we're going to be talking with some experts who have been working on the web telescope about the technology some of those amazing images of course and because of this i thought you know it'd be really cool to take a closer look at something interesting that happens in our brains when we look at cool colorful images so ghost like hunting them. right Kind of, I guess, you know, you're hunting for things, right, in pictures. Um, but really what this is about is have you, you know, ever looked at an inanimate object or maybe you, you know, just were looking in the sky and the clouds, right? And you kind of see something familiar. Okay. Right? So maybe, um, you know, there's a dog in the clouds or I don't know, maybe you, you know, you burn your toast and there's a dog or something, right? Um, so there's it's like the Virgin Mary or something like that in your exactly. toast. Exactly. You sell there's it to a, a place. For and... That. and it is this right here. Okay. So it's this Say coincidental it. ability for us to see familiar objects or patterns in otherwise random things to try to make sense of it all. And it's this phenomena called pareidolia. Okay. <laughs> okay? So it, it, uh, it comes from the Greek. It's the words para, meaning next to or uh, kind of besides. Okay. And eidolon, which means image or shape. So essentially you're seeing and you're interpreting something alongside of what it actually is. Okay. So, you know, when you look at a light socket, maybe you think it looks like a face. You know, or like you were saying, the Virgin Mary on toast on or you toast. Know, a keto or a pierogi that looks like Jesus or something. The angry yeah. octopus wants to fight the little uh, exactly. the little coat hanger thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or, okay. you know, like this is basically what the Rorschach test is about. So right. We see these random things and we interpret it different ways. But we all experience this in our everyday lives from time to time. And it has actually been around for centuries and especially in astronomy. OK. So you know, looking at this picture. Yes, there is your ghost. OK, <laughs> this is the ghost nebula. You can see What's some kind of creepy figures rising out of it. Thank there. you. Look at it. I mean, um, no, it does look like creepy figures. It right does. Here. That's why it's called the Ghost Nebula. Look at that. Oh. It kind of is very, you know, I don't know. I, I would imagine looking through a telescope, I'd be like, what is that? What is that? But Ghosts. also, if we look at things like constellations, right? So That's long my ago, cue to go to the next the image. Box that they saw in the sky there and came up with these 88 unique images of things like animals and people. And along with those images, they told stories and they would remind them of things like lessons or they would help them to predict the seasons. Right. Uh, and that's really helpful for them. So for example, with this picture here, Native Americans knew that when Ursa Major, the great bear, was low on the horizon, it was a fall. And they actually likened it to a story that there's this big bear that's terrorizing the land, eating all their food. And so these hunters go out, they shoot the bear, the back leg of the bear, but he jumps into the sky and gets away. And so they said the reason that the trees turn different shades of red in the fall, it's from the blood of the wound in that bear's back leg uh -huh. as he's kind of coming down to the horizon, sniffing it out, seeing if it's safe for him. Um, but then once the bear kind of rises back up into the sky again, it's safe for springtime and you know them to actually start growing plants I, and things like i did that. not know yeah. that also those were unsanctioned red circles so i fixed them with <laughs> customized you. dos red circles and now we're good to proceed with the show DOS art always <laughs> need some dos art um so also everyone actually the next image here um similar idea so the greeks related their constellation of the goddess persephone which also we see as virgo so the, the you know the maiden um to this pattern right so when she's visible it was the spring and the summertime so she is there she's the goddess of the spring she's bringing all of the nature you know to life and everything okay and then when she has to return to the underworld in the fall and the winter so half of the year she has to go back down and be with Hades down there. But her mother, Ceres, the goddess of the harvest, is very sad that she's gone. So she mourns. And of course, our harvest dries up and, you know, it's all um, cold and, and nothing can grow. And we have to bundle up until spring returns or she returns back over the horizon like that. I did not know so, either of these things. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I didn't know so that. Yeah. Stories. I'll have to do another pre-show of just constellations. So yeah. much fun. All so right. constellations, though, are just one example of this. We see these images in the stars. The moon is another great example of it, right? Maybe you've heard of the man in the moon yep. or the rabbit in the moon is a famous one in Chinese culture. Right. But there's also countless other astronomical instances, too. And Mars has a ton of really famous ones. Ah, uh, yes. So, That's yeah, this of one. course, you probably, you know, might recall actually the infamous canals of Mars. I talked about that a few months ago on here. Um, Mars is a great example. We have rovers there now that are showing us these glimpses of faraway places um, on Mars. 
Uh, but as we know, you know, pictures can be deceiving. So this picture is great. Um, this is the famous face on Mars. This was from 1976. We had the Viking One orbiter circling the planet, snapping photos, and it saw what looked like an enormous human face yep. staring back at the cameras from a region called Cydonia. And in reality, you know, it's just this huge mesa about two miles long. But the way that the shadows picked it up, it really does look like an eyes and a nose and a mouth, right? Yeah. So, of course, it blew up in the media. Was this evidence of alien life? What was that? Is this a conspiracy theory? So, yeah, NASA had to go back. There's an HD picture of it now. You know, this yeah. is um, the Mars Global Surveyor orbital camera. Um, and they show that, yes, it was just a rock formation. It's actually worn down quite a bit over time. This right. was uh, much later. Um, but it's kind of an area of great interest to scientists because they think that that area is on the edge of an ancient ocean in Mars. Um, but really just kind of a stunning image, right? Very interesting yeah, yeah. how the shadows play a trick on your mind like Not that. Not actually a face, though. This is like, you know, this is just the way the lighting was that day when they took that. Fo and then this is when it has different, more direct lighting. So then you sort of lose the whole face thing. Looks a little bit more like a monkey when you see it this way sure i mean yeah and everyone like, if you sure. see anything in these images let us know in the chat what kind of things do you see because everyone might see it slightly differently <laughs> uh, so there's another interesting sighting on mars okay um, this one's fun this was from the spirit rover in 2007 uh, and people say that this one looks like a mermaid or perhaps even Bigfoot. that's bigfoot Okay, in That's the rock Martian formation, Bigfoot. kind of similar to that, you know, walking of a Bigfoot picture that is so famous. It's adequately um, blurry, so it looks like Bigfoot. Like, oh yeah, of course, of course. Um, also, I do think it's kind of strange that a mermaid would be in a place that doesn't necessarily have liquid water around it. <laughs> but you know, hey, why not? It's it's a mermaid, sure. Um, and then also some other uh, interesting things. There is an iguana, an iguana. Um, a World War One helmet, a squirrel, a traffic light jelly donuts, what? Um, even a giant crab that was very famous a few years ago, and also this... even a statue of Barack Obama, which is bizarre. <laughs> Are those <laughs> but... all in this image? No, this is only okay. four of them. Okay. This is only four of them, but you can Google, you know, jelly donut on Mars. This or, looks like a you know, pierogi. That's Barack a frog Obama. or iguana. Mm -hmm. I have... What is this supposed to be? So if you look closely in that one, in the center there, it looks like a squirrel kind of crawling between two rocks. <laughs> it's like and a, it actually does. It actually it's like a low like crawl a... squirrel who's trying to sneak up and, and get the nuts, I guess, like right there, yeah. I guess, huh? All right. Yeah. Okay. So, of course, these things are just, you know, a trick of the mind. You know, we're thinking, you know, maybe we're even wishing that we see these things, some sort of recognizable thing to us, but in a faraway place. Okay. But, you know, you also have to think if there were Mars iguanas or squirrels, uh, they probably, you know, wouldn't necessarily look like the versions that we have here on Earth because the conditions are so very, very different. Although, you know, in the case of mermaids and Bigfoot, I can't really speak to that. <laughs> so I you, don't know. You think like huge lungs and like spindly arms because of low gravity, like there's low concentration in the atmosphere and then low gravity yeah. gives you big spindly spider looking arms or whatever. But yeah, maybe the scales on the mermaid would like help it to, I don't know, breathe the air. I, I don't She's know. She's going to have trouble know. swimming on Mars, I think, is the deal right <laughs> now. So. It swims through the sand. It's like it's like something from Dune or something. There you <laughs> go. Tremors, maybe. How about tremors? There you go. <laughs> okay. So elsewhere on Mars, then, Viking 1 also showed us a happy face crater. Right. Uh, this happy face crater, also known as Gaul, was originally discovered in the late 1970s. Um, though this shot is actually from March of 1999, if we have that one. Did I miss? Oh, yeah, there it is. It's right there. There it is. All right. All right there we so, go. Thank you. So, again, you can kind of see that happy face. Is that proof that aliens are telling us, hey, don't worry, be happy? I don't know. Uh, but if so, maybe they have a great sense of humor, uh, but probably not. Um, it just, yeah, probably coincidentally looks like a smiley face. But it does really stir your imagination. And actually, so much so, it was featured in the comic The Watchmen and also in uh, the, the movie version of it as well. There you go. Yeah, more DOS art. Love it. Like, that's yes. what it looks like to me, honestly. It's it's like that emoji. It's the emoji <laughs> with the tongue sticking out. It is. The Martians have a sense of humor. I'll buy it. <laughs> um, so now there's another actually very famous crater um, ah. that gave us a sense of pareidolia for sci-fi fans. This one's amazing. This is an image of Saturn's smallest moon, Mimas. And anyone want to take a guess what this looks like? I got it. Look, check it out. <laughs> How's that? There you go. Is that How's good? That? Should have, a, it. should have a thing it. around the bottom it of there, too. a heck of a lot like the Death Star. Uh -huh. from Mars. Oh, yes. Our first images of this moon actually came out in the early 80s, 
from Voyager. Right. And the first Star Wars movie had come out just a few years before. It was fresh on everyone's mind. And they said, that's no moon. That's a space station. <laughs> that's a space station. Y'all didn't know I had green, did you? Chat's like, wait, he has green? Yes, green is an option. I just like to uh, stick with red. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this is an updated image of it. Um, this is from Cassini in 2010. Uh, and again, that most noticeable thing there is, of course, that huge 80 mile wide Herschel crater. Uh, and it looks so much like the Death Star. I'm a huge Star Wars fan. It guys, looks so like I, that should have like knocked it apart or something. That crater is like a significant size of this whole body. It is. It's a small, small moon, though. It is a very... <sighs> Very small moon. So again, that's about eighty uh, miles wide. Okay. Uh, but still, yeah, that's a that's a giant crater. That's a huge on there. crater, yeah. Um, and actually, something else related to this one. As they were studying it, they took a heat map of the daytime temperatures oh. on that very moon, and they noticed something interesting. First of all, it's a little cooler, cooler around that crater, but the color pattern on it. What's that remind you of? That looks like chat. It's like a 10 second delay before chat will oh, I'll no, just say no. it. I see it in the chat. I it's Pac Man. It. There you go. Thanks, yeah. chat. <laughs> exactly. It looks like Pac Man eating the crater. Can you give us your like best so waka waka. <laughs> waka 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 waka. Oh, I love Pac Man. It's more like Fonzie, I think, than like Fonzie <laughs> Bear. True. Fozzie Bear, whichever. Is it Fonzie? I bet bear? you could find Fozzie Bear in a nebula or something. Did I just right? call him Fonzie Bear. Anyways, moving Fonzie. along. Hey. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, craters and shadowy rock formations, they are great for this, but yeah, what about nebulas, right? Nebulas. So we have light that's reflected elsewhere in the universe. Um, the Webb Space Telescope obviously is going to be giving us more and more really crystal clear images, but in the past we've had great ones from like Hubble, mm -hmm. right? So um, we see, you know, stars, we see clouds in space, and um, some of the most famous ones I think, you know, are these ones right here. So on the left, we have the Horsehead Nebula in the constellation of Orion. Um, it's very identifiable. That dark cloud of dust is in a star-forming region. Um, and uh, then, of course, on the right, we've got <laughs> the Bergen Nebula. I've labeled, it, I've labeled it the Bergen Nebula for Chris uh, Bergen, who is a fan of horses. Oh, perfect. Sorry. There you go. All right. So we'll call that the Chris Bergen Nebula. Um, and then on the right, we've got um, the Butterfly Nebula in Scorpius, which um, is centralized around a white dwarf star. And it's got this cool hourglass shape caused yep. by the gas and the dust shooting outward. So again, the names here make a lot of sense. Um, and you can really see those shapes. Of course, yeah. the horse head and then those beautiful wings shooting out from it. Uh -huh. uh, and, you know, just like so many things out in the unknown, though, some of them can actually start to look kind of spooky. Um, there's another image that kind of looks like a hand I think you've got it. it's from the, uh, the Chandra observatory oh, yeah, yeah. That. so that's actually an image of a pulsar that's a rotating star right so right. you can kind of equate it to something kind of like a lighthouse sort of it's it kind of like spins around yep um but it has twisted the dust in space around to look like this giant you know blue creepy yeah. hand reaching out that is sort of yeah. and it has something it's reaching for too it's not just a hand it's like reaching for a bagel or potato or whatever that thing at the top is i don't know a bagel a potato i'm hungry uh yeah i mean I, gosh yeah i don't know that could be any number of things actually it's kind of like a orangey disc there yeah um but so then we can also sometimes see images um uh in other you know nebulas around that are also very spooky um there's another one i don't want to give it away so i'll just have you go ahead and pull up the next one there you go all right so does anyone see a shape in this particular cloud. No um, this is something, a character perhaps that we might associate with Halloween. Um, and maybe like a side profile of something. Kind of like, I think a... I might've shown this one earlier on another pre-show. Oh yeah, I see it there's in the a, chat. There's a chin on this one, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. It's Man in the Moon, so this is Scream. Called... The Witch Head Nebula, because it does look like a witch's head. There you go, there's that cool overlay. Did so you, you draw really this? See... I, yeah, yeah. So nice. you can really see the eye, the nose, the the lips, the pointy chin, um, that pointed hat, right? So um, this, again, now this is a nebula. It's also um, a type of nebula called a reflection nebula because it really reflects the light of the closest nearby star there, which in this case is Rigel. Ah. So this is in the constellation of Orion um, and we see it actually shining blue. And it's not only because of the blue color of the star of Rigel, um, but also because the dust grains in it actually reflect blue light 
better than red light or other colors. Huh. Um, so this is kind of similar to, you know, the, the, why the sky is blue, right? Because the molecules in our atmosphere help to scatter the blue light really, really well. Yeah. Although if it were up to me, you know, I might colorize this one to make it look green to make it look like the Wicked Witch of the West. Well, it's... somebody in chat uh, said that there's like an alien face. It looks like an alien ghost. And look right here. Like there is definitely sort of an alien face there. Oh, yeah. If you look in there, that was like, I didn't see the alien face until somebody in chat said alien face. And now, yep. everybody, tell me if you continue to see the alien face. It looks meaner when I don't have my big crayon drawing <laughs> on it. I see it for sure. And, and that's what's so cool about this too, is that you can see other smaller ones inside of the bigger ones, just like yeah. how we have asterisms, which are smaller constellations inside of big ones. So the Big Dipper is a smaller constellation than asterism. Inside of a bigger one, right. Of Ursa Major. Oh, geez. I've been um, running my right. mouth too much here, so I'll be quiet. No, it's cool. We it's have cool. More uh, the next one on here. Um, also, you should probably be able to take a guess what this one looks like. Also, another kind of spooky one. Uh, so you've got kind of that central part there with these draw the... legs shooting off. I this one is the Black right. Widow Nebula. Right. This is in Circinus. So not actually something that we see up in the Northern Hemisphere, where I at least am located. Um, this is, well, first of all, so the center region of it um, is a bunch of kind of those yellow specks there. Those are baby stars. Yep, yep. And during formation, those stars, again, give off these solar winds. There's these streams of charged particles coming out. So kind of similar with like the way the um, butterfly one looked. Um, they blow this gas kind of outward to form these bubbles and these cavities and things. So we had these two big ones on either side that really give it this cool spider shaped legs yeah. and you know that the body there. Um, but I mentioned, yeah, you can only see it from the Southern hemisphere. So again, Circinus is one of those uh, constellations that you can only see down south. And um, this, so this is below the equator, kind of South America, Australia, that yep. sort of thing, if you're tuning in from there. Hello. Uh, but actually, I think it's kind of appropriate because I'm pretty sure there are some super terrifying spiders down in Australia. That it's the you, Australian so. Nebula. Nice. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So again, this is in the constellation Circinus, which is the uh, Mariner's Compass. All right. Um, so yeah, now there's another fun one that I do want to show you too of the sun. I've got that one. There got we go. One. There we go. So this is from 2014. Uh, the NASA Solar Dynamics Observatory captured this one. This is an ultraviolet image of our very own sun. Right. Um, it shows some of the active regions as brighter because those areas actually give off more light and energy. And they mark some really intense magnetic fields that are hovering in the sun's atmosphere called the corona. Uh -huh. Now, this particular image, though, blends together two sets of extreme ultraviolet wavelengths. This is from Hubble. Um, and they are typically colorized in gold and yellow anyway, but this is just such a cool picture. And yeah, I see it in the chat. Two people are saying yeah. things kind of like perfect for Halloween. It looks like a jack-o'-lantern. It really gives you that creepy, spooky kind of jack-o'-lantern. It kind of gives me like vibes of a jack-o'-lantern with like the, the pattern baldness sort of thing going on. Like there's hair on the side where you wouldn't normally have it on the jack-o'-lantern, right? You have hair on your jack-o'-lanterns? I This one does. Look, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I can see the that like might be eyes. A fire hazard does. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you might not to put hair on your jack-o'-lantern. And then I mean, there's like some hair on the side here see there's like these are like mutton oh, chops or All something right. yeah, see yeah you got the, the patches nice no, no no chat back me up come on it's got hair um what else it's do we have we're, we're coming up on our time limit here but what else do we have yep yep so yeah those amazing images you know that we just looked at a lot of them came from hubble web obviously though has given us some clearer ones so we can kind of go through these these are a little fun but first yeah um sometimes you know we see things like um, animals and people but other things can also sometimes remind us of other things, yep. house things, nostalgic things. Um, if you were on social media at all last month when our web first images were released, you no doubt saw a few um, very funny memes floating around of what some of those images like reminded this. us of. So that picture that he just had up, first of all, was uh, JWST's first deep field image. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Um, last month, you know, President Biden revealed this one. It is uh, just, you know, the, 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 the basic overall is it covered a patch of sky about the size of a grain of sand. If you were to hold it out at arm's length. It's your arm's length, right. Down here on Earth. Um, really amazing image, not to belittle it at all. You know, showing us thousands of other galaxies. Um, it's a composite of 690 individual frames and images at different wavelengths yep. um, taken by the near-infrared camera. Um, it's the deepest, sharpest view of our universe that we have right now. It's amazing. Um, but yeah, so looking at this gorgeous image, right, and people start 
you know, obviously changing their computer desktops and phone backgrounds and everything, and also commenting on its similarity to everyday objects. Yes, nice try, NASA. So countertops. <laughs> this guy thought the image looked just like his sparkly black granite countertops. It does. Both you knows we can definitely relate. Um, I actually saw one floating around that was a picture of the linoleum on the floor of the subway. There's like a, a there's different kinds, but one yeah. of them is like black or red with like little speckles on it. Yeah. Maybe not quite the same thing, but willing to venture. There's plenty of other strange mutant alien things growing on those floors. Um, yes, carpets. Carpets. Another one I love. We all remember cosmic bowling, right? Yep. So yep. the neon lights, the stars, the, the swirly patterns. The black light sort of thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Often carries over into the carpeting there in bowling alleys and arcades and stuff because yep. of those dim lights. So here's the truth behind the JWST deep field image. Took a What's picture of the carpet. Thing, right? <laughs> They're so great. I love these. They're so creative. They're just so perfect. The nostalgia. And then this one. Yes. So, so in awe of the gravitational lensing, never expected to see such clarity and color. <laughs> So this is referencing the squiggly lines on the seats, you know, probably on a bus, maybe the KSC tour bus you've yeah. been on, right? We've all sat on those. And but here it's actually a nod to the way that some of the light in that original deep field image is... appears bend around the center there, which is so cool. So many people took note of that when the image was unveiled. The mass of all of those galaxies that we're looking at, it actually warps space and it basically creates a lens that we can look through at things behind it. Yep. And so the light from the galaxies in the distance ultimately actually does get distorted and it magnifies some of the things that we have behind it and it stretches it and bends other things. Um, so you can kind of think of it maybe like, you know, if we had like a bowling ball and you stuck it on a mattress, uh, kind of, you know, dip, the whole thing. Like yeah. Um, we used to actually do an activity at the museum where we had a large piece of material. We called it the fabric of space. Oh, geez. And uh, the students would sit around it. It's kind of stretchy, you know, and they hold it. We put a billiard ball in the center and then like some lighter like ping pong balls and stuff. Yep, so they yep. could toss it in. And it would really demonstrate, though, how the mass attracts those smaller objects or moons, right, um, around it if, if that was a planet, you know. So kind of a similar thing here. That light path gets warped around it. And then finally, finally. Uh, while all the web images have been absolutely breathtaking, my personal favorite has been the Carina Nebula, nearby uh, star forming region in the Milky Way galaxy. But somebody noticed that it actually has a crazy similarity between uh, uh, well, what we see there and also the eastern coastline of Algeria. Algeria, the eastern Look coastline of Algeria. It almost it matches. It looks so similar, right? It's Isn't like the it whole not? universe is one big uh, fractal. Like, like What is it? Like, it like drills down and it's the same, 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 same all the way down, uh, like a Mandelbrot fractal or whatever, right? I think I got yeah. that right. Chad, help kind me out. Yeah, okay, I got that right. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, the coastline of Algeria is actually in the Carina Nebula, which is... Bonkers. <laughs> there you go. We are out of time. It's 3.30. I need to get the special guests in. Oh, yeah. They're sitting over here wondering if I'm actually going to let them in the show. But real quick, we've got one more thing to mention, don't we, Alicia? That's right. That's right. So, well, actually, first of all, this coming Friday, if you are in town, we've got our last movie night of the summer. We're showing Blade Runner, right. uh, another movie celebrating its 40th anniversary as we celebrate our museum's 40th anniversary. But also coming up next month, we've got another astronomy night. So we've got activities and demonstrations and stargazing on the flight deck on site um, also we are so excited to be hosting fred hayes yes. legendary apollo 13 astronaut in conversation with former nasa astronaut mike massimino about his new book never panic early so that's going, going to actually be in person and streaming online as well because mr das i do believe you will be on site with us it's true i've been suckered into coming out to intrepid it's been so long since i've been there i always love going out and doing the astronomy nights in person and i will come out there we'll help get this stream so that y'all can join in on uh, the discussion with fred and mike Fred and Mike. It's like, yeah, you know, talk with Fred and Mike. You know, the guy with the went around the moon and then the guy that went up to the Hubble. Then no big deal. So. <laughs> also, actually, just to plug one more thing, I am very fortunate to have been invited back down to NASA uh, to see the launch of SLS yes. next weekend. So uh, stay tuned to our Intrepid and my also uh, personal um, social media channels because I will be uh, dumping all that content there as it happens, too. So, so excited for that. I'm sure everyone will be tuned in as well. Oh my gosh, it's going to be great. It's going to be a good time. It's so fantastic that you got another opportunity to go down there with the NASA social and see everybody's favorite orange rocket, mostly because there's not very many orange rockets, but uh, it will be a very fantastic event to see in person. I guarantee That's you right. that. And you know what? Orange rocket good. Orange rocket is good. That's true. <laughs> um, anyways, y'all, it's Alicia Seagull. You've seen her on the show so many times. Alicia, thank you so much for doing the pre-show with us here. We always appreciate you gracing us with your presence. 
Of course. Have a wonderful Astronomy Live, everyone. I'll see you later. All right. Have fun ghost hunting. I will. <laughs> All right, let's see here, folks. So I'm going to hop over. I'm going to get our special guest from the James Webb Space Telescope team here. My phone hasn't gone off. They haven't texted me yet, so I think I'm not quite too late. But I'll hop over. We'll get them here chatting with us. And when we come back, we will continue on with the Virtual Astronomy Live show here today with Intrepid Museum and NASA Space Flight. Remember, Virtual Astronomy Live is supported through a NASA cooperative agreement awarded to the New York Space Grants Consortium. Thanks to them so much for their support. I literally just showed it on the screen, apparently. That's fine. That's what I was reading from. <laughs> Let's get our special guests here, and I will be right back. Where's our transition video? It's a good time for an NSF Live today, y'all. Good times. Every year, more than a million visitors embark on a voyage of discovery at Intrepid, a museum on board an aircraft carrier devoted to the intersection of history, science, innovation, and service. They come to the museum to learn, to explore, to engage, and to see firsthand the artifacts that marked critical moments in history and spark our future. They are up close and personal with living history, learning about the past, while contemplating the possibilities of tomorrow through 21st century technology. Within intrepid steel walls are moments. A sense of wonder when a student sees history come alive, goosebumps when a memory is sparked, and understanding when a returning service member connects with a fellow veteran. But Intrepid's reach extends far beyond this great carrier's steel walls and decks. Every day, it is making a difference in the lives of so many, in our immediate neighborhood and all around the world. Intrepid also brings learning experiences to students participating in CASA, New York City's cultural after-school adventures program throughout its five boroughs. Designed to support the diverse needs of learners in New York City public schools, Intrepid's CASA programs integrate history, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math into out-of-school time experiences to help build in-school success. Our VET video chats reconnect veterans with the legacy of service. My name is Charlotte, and I'm really happy to be connecting with you all. And these are artifacts that are related to work, but also to leisure. We are a ship of ideas, sailing forth to communities near and far, to schools, libraries, housing projects, senior centers, correctional facilities, veterans centers, and children's hospitals to engage and inspire those who can't come to us. All right. Whew. I'm back. I've got more people with me. It's one of these shows that just keeps on going on, y'all. Welcome our members of the James Webb Space Telescope team here and our moderator, Summer Ash. How's everybody doing today? Great. All right, everybody's little lights lit up, so I assume everybody was talking to us there. I think we're good. Folks, I'm gonna turn the show over here to Summer. Summer, you can do the detailed introductions with Mike and Stephanie, but remember, folks, if you're watching, tag us in chat, ask us questions at NASA Space Flight, or just put question in one of the other chats. Over the course of the show there, I'll be getting some questions, and we'll ask them here to our guests from James Webb Space Telescope team. Y'all aren't from the telescope, you're from the team that worked in the telescope, right? Yeah. That's right. That's the right way to say it. Okay, Summer, your show. Go ahead. Thanks, Doss. I know that Alicia is not on anymore, but I do want to send her a message and just say that I saw her earrings. Um, so I raised her just a little bit. <laughs> Got to represent on a theme. I love it. So thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, we're super excited to talk with people from the team of JWST. And joining me today, we have Stephanie Millam. She's a planetary scientist at NASA Goddard, and she serves as deputy project scientist for Planetary Science. 
And also joining us is Mike Menzel, and he is the NASA Mission Systems Engineer for JWST, also at Goddard. Mike and Stephanie, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, Thanks for having us. <laughs> So before we get into all the coolness of JWST and these recent images, uh, I would love to just hear from both of you how you first got interested in science and how you found your way to NASA in the current position. So up for grabs, let's go. Stephanie, go ahead. <laughs> okay, um, my story is pretty direct. Um, I grew up in Houston, Texas, and and I had a school field trip when I was in grade school to Johnson Space Center. And I was about six years old and I came home and I told my mom I was going to work for NASA one day and or be Madonna. Madonna was already taken, so NASA it is. <laughs> um, I spent the rest of my life um, pretty much trying to be either an astronaut or a research scientist to, to work on the space shuttle, um, to go to space someday. Uh, I, I think I'm past my prime of being an astronaut, but um, it's been a great honor to be part of the JWST team. Um, I've been on it for about 10 years now. Nice. How about you, Mike? Well, I was kind of a child of the space age. I watched the, uh, I was around to hear Kennedy put together the, uh, you know, the, the goal of landing a man on the moon. I watched it happen. And, uh, one of my grandfathers, my paternal grandfather, got me interested in astronomy when I was six years old. Uh, meanwhile, my uh, maternal grandfather was a you know a private pilot. He got me interested in flying. So between that, watching the space program develop and just loving astronomy since I was six years old, I uh, I just kind of you know got into this. I wanted to be a radio astronomer, but as it turned out, um, after I got out of uh, after I got my bachelor's degree, I got a master's degree in physics and. Uh, the one radio astronomer who was at Columbia left. So I ended up just staying in systems engineering and I've uh, been having, a, I've loved it ever since. So I've uh, I just lucked out to get, you know, to be on the, the James Webb team and I'm just happy to be part of it. Uh, where were each of you when the telescope launched uh, <laughs> back in December? I was home here in Annapolis, Maryland, um, sitting on my couch with um, my significant other and my niece. Uh, she was here visiting for, from Texas and um, we got to watch and we all cried and were emotional and um, celebrated the holiday thereafter. I was at the uh, Space Telescope Science Institute in the Control Center and uh, I, I, was, I was on console and uh, uh, I this, uh, I was on console through uh, all of the deployments and all of the commissioning. I didn't cry. Had I seen something gone wrong, I probably would have started crying very badly. But uh, uh, I um, I was very happy to see the launch. Although during the launch, um, I got asked by a lot of reporters after it, how did I feel? And my emotions were kind of subdued because I knew that the, the worst was yet to come. So, But it, it, was, it was a happy day. It was a happy moment, but it was just the start of it. Yeah, I could imagine that you were also very focused because being on console and everything would kind of kind of keep everything else kind of at bay. But it was, I, was, it was. I was curious, though, throughout the everything else that needed to happen, um, all the unfolding and alignment and calibration, how many times were you holding your breath? Well, Stephanie, you go ahead first. <laughs> um, I think for six months. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Of the world record, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it was very in, it was very intense. Um, so I am not quite as involved or hands on as as Mike was during all of commissioning, but I was on console um, as part of the science team. We were rotating um, various shifts, and so I got to be there at some of the key moments, which was really exciting. Um, like the moment we got our first data, our first photons down when we were starting to align the mirror. I was on shift that day. Um, so that was an extremely exciting day and a very exciting shift. Um, I wasn't there during most of the deployments, though, and those I was just lying awake anxiously waiting to see the news come in either on my phone or my computer um, that everything went OK. And uh, yeah, a lot of breath holding and, and sleepless nights. Yeah, I saw the, 
the James Webb Telescope Instagram account had a really great graphic where they were ticking off all the single point failures. And I was like, every time I saw like success, 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 I was just like, this is incredible. Real quick, did y'all see my mug? Right, it's James Webb on one side, but the other side is the do not talk to me before, not my first coffee, but James Webb Space Telescope is deployed. <laughs> that was my mug. That's so very good. Speaking of uh, don't talk to me until this thing, like 300 and something points are all good to go. Back to y'all. 344. 344. Jeez. That burned in your brain, Mike? Oh, yeah. I uh, During the, right after the, um, the deployment, well, right after the last one was complete, by the way, there, there was about 178 release mechanisms. And uh, I walked into the room after the last one fired. And I guess there were film crews there. And I just blurted out, can you imagine how many of my future passwords are going to have the number 178 in it? <laughs> and, uh, you know, everyone said, well, you just announced that to the world, to which I said, well, I'm a civil servant. There's, there's nothing in my account worth stealing. <laughs> Um, so kind of as you've alluded to, Mike, a lot of your involvement or you, you've you had a ton of involvement um, and a lot of that has been way before uh, launch and probably even before the telescope started being built. Can you tell I was us on it for 25 that? years. Yeah. So I, I mean, and I consider myself very lucky because I've had the, the the privilege and the luck to see this thing evolve from cartoons to preliminary drawings, to detailed drawings, to hardware, to to the launch, and then you know the commissioning. So it's kind of rare that someone gets that opportunity, and I consider myself pretty lucky that I did. So, as a systems engineer, did you just have your hands on every every <laughs> team that was working on the telescope? For 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 the most part, but the teams themselves were, you know, we 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 really did have a world class organization on this but but I did make a joke and you know I've, I've said it to you before that a, a lot of the folks didn't know me because if I showed up at your meeting that means there was a problem and uh and over the course of 25 years a lot of people got to know me and uh you know, if I'm sitting in your meeting that means that that's probably that that ain't a great sign but you know we, we got through all the problems and uh and you know you see the results yeah so speaking of those results what was going through your brains your and uh, hearts when those first images were uh, released last month? I mean, what did you think? Well, I, I can tell you what I thought, and it happened way before the first, um, uh, the first images were released. Yeah. I, I was sitting next to Lee Feinberg. Lee is our, um, he, he was ahead of our, uh, of our telescope. He was our telescope manager, and he's also a world-class optical engineer. So when we saw the first images, even before we had phased all of the 18 mirrors, right. Lee turned to me and he said, Mike, this thing's really going to work good. And, you know, he was he had his sleepless nights, as did we all. But when Lee said that to me, I I, I was astounded. And then after we put each of the 18 individual mirrors acted like an individual telescope. So you would saw 18 right. individual images of the same star. But when we started to combine them. Yeah. Lee and I looked and when we saw the first images way back before the initial release, Lee and I were squinting at the screen looking and I'm like, look at all the galaxies. And I pointed out to Lee, those those fuzzy things are galaxies. And we, we, we didn't even fine tune this thing yet. So uh, it, it, part of it was um, by time, you know, when I saw that first image with Lee, we knew it was going to be spectacular. And, you know, so it was kind of it took a, it stole a little bit of the uh, of the thrill away from me. But the, the first images were were really incredible. But my first gut reaction was when Lee Feinberg turned to me and said, this thing's going to work. Yeah, that's got to be cool to have somebody by your side who knows exactly what it's seeing and just being like, this is quality. Um, Doss, is there, um, I think there's a movie of showing like when Webb was aligned. Probably. Yeah. yeah. That has something good. I <laughs> think we can do that. <laughs> Here we go. Groovy NASA music. Yeah, I know, right? There was some groovy NASA music there. Uh, this, I think, is the one you were looking for, right? It's a very short movie, but here we go. Yeah. 
I feel like I need oh, to play it at like half, half speed. <laughs> yes. It's flying by. Well, let's take a look at that first image, uh, the um, the deep field one. I've got that one as well. How's that strike your fancy? Yeah. Speaking of galaxies photobombing everything. Yeah. <laughs> fancy. Oh, the movie back on. It just hopped back over there. There we go. Um, so, Stephanie, I know you're a planetary scientist. Um, oh, it likes to hop. It does like to hop. There. <laughs> I'll beat it into submission here. It's fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was going to say, um, what can you tell us about this image besides the amazingness of it? Uh, yeah. Um, there's a lot to say about the amazingness of this image. So this is um, a very small speck of the sky. So if you extend your arm out and you held a grain of sand, that's about the size of the sky that we're imaging here. And what you're seeing is thousands of galaxies. Um, if you compare this image to like the Hubble version, um, they're totally different. It's amazing to see the level of detail that we can get in that tiny grain of sand, how all of the structures of all of these galaxies are now resolved. We can see spiral galaxies. We can see star forming happening in different galaxies. Um, the different sizes, the different shapes, um, the colors represented um, represent very different things. Um, sometimes it means that there's a lot of dust or stars being born. Sometimes it means that the light from that galaxy is coming from so, so far away that it's actually stretched from visible light like we see with our eyes into longer wavelengths in the infrared. And so that's why sometimes they look red and fuzzy. Um, there's all kinds of things in this, but one of the coolest looking things in this particular image and something that I, I love to point out. So you see five sort of bright galaxies going right across the center. Um, those are really massive galaxies. And what they're doing is they're acting like a lens and they're pulling the light of all the stuff from behind them all the way around so that we can see them better. And so you see some of these objects that look like they're almost smeared or um, dripping. <laughs> I like to compare them to like Dolly's dripping clocks. Um, they're, they're very smeared. And what that is, is it's actually the lensing effect happening, um, pulling the light of these galaxies that are much, much further away than what you see in the foreground um, around and, and into a closer proximity where we can study them. Um, so that's a really cool effect that was demonstrated in this first image. The other thing to take home with this is this was only, a, this, this whole image took about 12 hours to acquire the data. That's incredible. All of the ultra deep fields that you can imagine that the Hubble Space Telescope have done took weeks. Um, and this is a mere 12 hours. This is simply a blink of an eye and we're already seeing just incredibly vast amount more in the sky than we've ever been able to do with other observatories. And so I love this image for that, that one takeaway message. Is this is really just an instant of time for the James Webb Space Telescope mission. Yeah, and I love the comparison to the Hubble ultra deep field because I used to use that to sort of teach a lot of what you can see in this image that you touched upon with um, galaxies that are either close or far um, or stars that are um, old or young and why things are different colors, why things are different shapes. But now like to add the gravitational lensing into that is incredible. and. I think I remember like the Hubble deep field was like a 10th of the full moon or something, which I'm going to guess is more like a small M&M or something. <laughs> Arms length. A I've heard postage range. stamp or something like that. Yeah. But we have seen lensing from other observatories. This isn't yeah, the first yeah. time we've seen it. It's just, it's but really awesome. cool that we're seeing it in the first image or the first deep field that uh, the Webb telescope has revealed. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> oh, it's so stunning. Um, but so you are a planetary scientist and I know that, um, one of the things that I read in your bio talked about how you would kind of consult, um, or you act as the in-house expert to evaluate the science and operations, uh, design decisions required to make sure that JWST had the, the planetary capabilities. And I wanted to know what, what does that all mean? Yeah, so maybe not design as much as operations. Yeah. Um, by the time I joined the telescope, um, it was funny because the first thing I got asked, even when I was being interviewed, is 
what would you change or make or improve on the James Webb Space Telescope as it's being delivered? And I was like, well, I want more resolution because I'm a radio astronomer by trade. So I'm used to very high resolution spectroscopy. And um, the spectroscopy we get with JWST is um, about three orders of magnitude less than what I have dealt with in my entire career. So um, I consider it to be medium or low resolution, whereas um, a lot of people that do like extra, extra galactic astronomy, they're like, oh, it's high resolution at three at a resolution of 3000. Um, but at any rate, uh, everything was already being delivered and I don't I didn't get a choice uh, to, to change the instruments, of, you know, 10 years ago. Um, because they were actually being delivered to Goddard. So um, operationally, what my role was, was to make sure that we could track objects moving in our solar system. Um, so that's really hard. We have this big floppy telescope. Um, it, it almost looks like a sailboat, right? It has this huge uh, sun shield that's the size of a tennis court and the sun, the solar radiation pressure is constantly pushing on it. Um, we have to, you know, burn fuel to stay where we want to be in its orbit. Um, but it has this instrumentation and, and extreme precision pointing that, it, that it's supposed to be able to do to point at the first stars and galaxies across the universe. And I want to look at the brightest thing in the infrared sky, which is Mars. Oh, and by the way, it's moving really fast compared to the stars that are behind it. So <laughs> now we take this giant floppy sailboat looking of a telescope and we have to make it track across the sky. And oh, by the way, it has to take these really fantastic images that it's doing with, you know, like the image that we just saw across the universe. So um, operationally, that that proved to be a little bit of a challenge. Um, we we knew that we wanted to track as fast as Mars, but then they brought someone like myself on to be the planetary scientist. And my area of study is actually comets, which move a heck of a lot faster than, than Mars does. And so I was like, well, maybe we should push a little faster. <laughs> um, I'm also the person that's probably flying past you going down the freeway. Um, I push the speed limit as much as I possibly can. Um, don't tell any of the local cops that it's okay. We're uh, not streaming it or anything. Not. <laughs> yeah, There's no live stream involved here. It's fine. Right. Right. Um, so in order to make us push on that, that requirement, that limit, um, we had to have the science to stand behind it. And so my role was not only, you know, to, to ensure that this was actually, that we could actually track at a certain speed limit and we could observe things like Mars, but to, understand what the scientific return was for pushing on the, the, limit, the limits that we had already set in place and understand if we really wanted to make it go faster, if we really wanted to do smaller subarrays so that we could do imaging of Jupiter, for example. Um, these kinds of things are something that we can do operationally with software, um, working with the instrument teams to understand, you know, uh, readout effects on the detectors and things like that. And so um, understanding the science capability and what the, the planetary science community really wanted was sort of my role. And um, we're doing everything from near Earth asteroids now to the outer solar system. So it's, it's very exciting. Mike, did Stephanie just throw wrenches in the works? When I was <laughs> no, no, no not at all. Um, we, we had a, you know, when the new requirement for moving targets came out, we, uh, you know, we weren't, we were not going to change hardware to do it because we had already had been past the point where we would be, you know, um, we could change hardware without a lot of cost implications. But um, we found that we could do it just with software. What we would do is uh, the telescope uh, stays steady by looking at what we call a guide star, mm -hmm. right? And if the uh, if one of our instruments called a fine guidance sensor, if it's keeping that star on the same set of pixels, then the image isn't moving. The image is crisp. Right. Well, what we did was we changed our software to fool the telescope to say, uh, hey, we're going to add an error into that signal. And that error that we're adding is going to be the uh, the motion that you want the telescope to do. So where the software just tricked the telescope into saying, hey, You'll keep that guide star if it where where you think it is, provided you add this error in. And the error was the motion that we wanted to track. Wow. And 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 not only you know did we achieve that, 
uh, we're actually going to use the telescope, the James Webb telescope, to watch the uh, the DART mission, the Marsh, the mission that's going to try to change the minutely change the trajectory of an asteroid coming up in September. Right. So uh, we're going to be using our um, our capability for moving target to to try to watch that event, and and to do that, we're we're right now trying to figure out exactly um, what solar system object we could use to, as a test, yes. mm -hmm. and. Uh, I haven't talked to Stephanie about this, so you know I, I was sitting and listening to what the astronomers might select, and I was, you know, thinking, well, Phobos or Deimos, one of one of the Martian satellites might be a good good test run for this, but uh, we're not sure whether they're going to be too close to Mars to do it, you know, because Mars will give a pretty big glare. But um, basically, everything that Stephanie had asked for, thank God, was could be uh, accomplished with software changes. And then, you know, so far it looks like not only have we got the moving targets, uh, that capability down, but we seem to be maintaining our image quality while we're doing it. We're not getting any blurs and the, the images are staying sharp when we exercise that option for moving targets. I've, I've got a question that's relevant to that, Summer. Can I hop in with a question real quick? Absolutely. I was actually just going to ask you. Uh, there you go. So, so this one's from Paul Kelly, and Paul asks, or, or sort of comments at first, Hubble images got better and better over the years. How much of that was hardware upgrades versus experience running the telescope? Okay, Hubble. But do y'all expect the same sort of thing to happen with James Webb, where you can increase the processing or you gain more experience? I mean, that's sort of what you were just talking about, tracking these special types of targets, right, Mike? It might be a little harder. See, I did work Hubble. Right. And part of the reason Hubble images got better and better was we were putting new instruments up there. Right. With, with, with uh, I think there were a total of five servicing missions and each servicing mission improved the images because uh, each subsequent complement of instruments had better, better capabilities. Uh, you know, you can't expect that from James Webb. Right. Um, I would suspect that our, um, our image processing capabilities will learn some tricks to take away features or things in our instruments. I, I would expect that, yeah. but I would not expect the improvements that you saw with Hubble. Cause I believe the majority of those were due to the new generations of instruments that we put up there. Right. Like actual physical Stephanie, hardware uh, yeah, being something. added. Yeah. Stephanie, how there about you? There is something to be said though. Um, we did learn how to use Hubble in different ways than we had planned on using it. So exoplanets, for example, weren't even known to exist when Hubble was launched. And now it's a total area of research and science. And so scientists learn how to use the instrumentation that was already on board with the Hubble telescope in ways to really manipulate that instrumentation to be able to observe planets around other stars. So you can imagine where like little struts and things that are holding the mirrors in place. And they were using that almost as, you know, these, these ways to block the starlight so that they could see the planet around it. Okay. Um, they learned how to do spectroscopy in ways where they could actually move the telescope from the star and away from it. And it kind of smeared the light in a way that they could actually start resolving things um, that were near a star or in, in that planetary system. So there's the, astronomy observational community is very, very clever when it comes to these kinds of things. And as new things are discovered, they'll learn how to use these observatories in ways that we never envisioned. And so part of what we were trying to set ourselves up for as far as the, the science community is making sure we had capabilities that encompassed all of the science that we can imagine that we want to do today, and then have that sort of know-how of the instrumentation of the operation so that if we do want to try to do different things, that's something we can work on and try to tweak in, in real time. So yeah. um, it, it's definitely exciting to think of what's going to be next with the JWST. Um, we already have our, a whole bucket full of things that we already want to do. And even that is overfilling with new ideas almost weekly I'm just seeing the first images, just seeing the first data coming in. People already have new ideas and they're they're really excited about what's coming next.
Yeah, good deal. That, that I mean, when you mentioned the tracking, like, oh, Mars moves faster in the sky than the background stars. Like, of course, that makes sense, but I had never thought about that. And you have to sort of build that in and learn how to make the telescope be able to do those sorts of things like you were talking about, Mike. But, you know, it, it makes perfect sense that Mars is closer and it's sort of orbiting closer. And if you're looking 13 billion years across the universe, that's <laughs> a little bit different than looking at Mars. That's going like this, I guess, relatively across the screen. So across the screen, I mean, you know what I mean. <laughs> Okay, cool. Summer, back to y'all. No, that was a great question. And that your answer just reminded me how I always like to emphasize that science and scientists are very creative. I think we use the word like problem solving all the time, but it really is creativity. And so people sometimes normally separate that out and they're like, oh, creativity goes with like arts um, and problem solving is engineering and math, but they really, they're really the same thing. They can be the same thing. I don't know that Mike would call us creative. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I, I would call you creative. And, uh, uh, but part of it is uh, I'm just half an engineer. The other half wanted to be an astronomer. So, so I, I'm in a, I'm in a good, good place to, to mediate between the two worlds. <laughs> I was going to say you found the perfect job then. Uh, I'm very happy with the job I got. So did um, some of the other, um, I guess, science cases or astronomy groups, like, so I imagine that there's probably also a group that's doing galaxy evolution or uh, cosmology or something. Did a lot of the other groups kind of have these problems and these new requirements that they wanted to have along the way post hardware being fixed? Not, uh, no, to, to be honest with you, not really. Um, with the exception of moving targets and um, uh, you know a, a couple of other very minute require you know uh, uh, requirements dealing with the way we measured resolution and things like that, image quality. For the most part, our requirements were frozen pretty good for many many years. Um, so, we, which was fortunate because you know we were under a lot of scrutiny. We we definitely took longer than we were supposed to to build this thing. And, you know, um, I've been in front of a couple of, of subcommittees that were really watching us to make sure we didn't have what we call requirements creep. And even even when, um, you know, during the 25 years that we've been building this thing, exoplanets took off as a new field of endeavor. That wasn't in our original uh, four science themes. But fortunately for us, the, um, the requirements that we had and we the requirements that we specified the observatory to be designed to were, was more than adequate to cover this new science, you know, particularly the exoplanet field that was developing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were, we were not only fortunate, but we had to be vigilant about that. We had some new requirements, but they were not, uh, we wouldn't let them drive. You know, us engineers knew that exoplanets were going to be a big field. It was an important field. And we knew that things like coronography, the ability to, um, cancel out the light of the bright star and see the dim planet would be important, but we had to make sure that we were not driving cost and schedule with those requirements. Unfortunately, we did not. Can we talk about that real quick? Uh, a couple people don't quite get how Webb can image exoplanets. So I think we could talk a little bit about how we're actually using the telescope. It's not like you're taking a picture of the surface of an exoplanet, right? No. That's not a thing. Um, I'll, I'll, well, uh, you know, Web, uh, Web wasn't built so much to image exoplanets, and, and it would probably have a hard time with most, if not all of them. The majority of measurements we make on exoplanets are when the planet goes in front of the star. It, it makes a little mini eclipse. They call it a transit. And by watching the way light, um, uh, the light decreases in different wavelengths, you could start to tell that, uh, hey, you know, uh, when the planet goes in front of the star, this wavelength falls quicker than that wavelength. Oh, that may be indicative of carbon dioxide, of water. And, you know, um, uh, well, you, you pick it up from there. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was this, this graph, right? <laughs> Okay, somebody tell me what this graph means. Das, you're like in my head because I was <laughs> Sorry. my next question was like, well, let's talk about what the first exoplanet result was. Right. This is um, this is a planet that is um, 
a, a very large planet. It's um, about twice the size of Jupiter, but it's about half the density. So we knew that this planet was going to be a good first glimpse of how we can actually study the atmosphere of a planet around another star because it's extremely puffy. And so what happens is, as Mike was saying, a planet goes in front of its star, but you can imagine this giant puffy atmosphere creating like this, you know, this big puffy atmosphere around a solid <laughs> body. So once it goes, the atmosphere alone goes in front of the star, there's some amount of of light that is lost, but then the solid body of the planet comes in and even more light is lost. And so it's actually right when the atmosphere passes before the terrestrial component of a planet is what's really interesting to study what the atmosphere is made of. And so, um, as he said, we study this at different wavelengths to see what that composition looks like. And so what we did for our first exoplanet transit spectrum um, is we were looking for water vapor on this planet. Um, so that was something that was anticipated already known in this planet. It's also got a very short orbit. It's really, really close to its star. It's even closer than Mercury is to our own sun. So we knew it was gonna be really, really hot. Most of the water was gonna be in a gas phase. So we should see a lot of water vapor. And so that's what exactly what you're seeing. You're seeing a bunch of hills and valleys as we go across in wavelength. So each one of the dots is where we're measuring that, that transit going across the planet at a given wavelength. And we're studying how much that light is either depleted or not compared to the star. And um, so every time you see a hill um, at a given point, that is representative of one of water's fingerprints. So just like you have a different fingerprint than I do, um, every molecule has a very specific fingerprint pattern. And so we're looking for those fingerprints to know what different molecules are there. Um, this is a cool spectrum because it shows the first time a plant, an exoplanet or a planet around another star, a spectrum beyond 1.7 microns. Um, Webb can even go further. So we'll be going into all the way into the mid infrared with um, transiting exoplanets. Um, but this was the first time we actually released a spectrum that's beyond that wavelength range. And it's a very clear signature of water. So this was really exciting for us just to have a good first glimpse. Again, just a glimpse. This is only about seven hours worth of time. Um, all of these images that we took for the first images were, were all acquired within a matter of, I think, two weeks total amount of time on sky. And so you can just imagine um, how quick all of this was. We're already into months worth of operations now. So you can imagine how much science we've already acquired with the JWST um, just compared to these first two weeks of the first images. So it's really, really exciting. Um, and studying planets around other stars is a very hot topic. And we really want to understand what those atmospheres look like. Um, Stephanie, you mentioned that uh, this like twice as big as Jupiter or twice as massive. Um, but Webb did a test image of Jupiter. Can we look at that? And is first of all, because it's gorgeous and I love Jupiter. But second of all, is so is this just like um, a test to make sure that how we image the solar system planets is working. Yeah, um, so this was a series of tests that we were doing to study um, how we can observe bright objects in our solar system. So all of our instruments are lined up so that we can actually see the sky with every single instrument that JWST has at one time. Um, so they all see different parts of the sky so you can imagine all the light that's being collected from JWST is now sort of um, dispersed across all of these instruments. And so what we wanted to do was make sure if we were using the near infrared camera, for example, which is what you're seeing here, that we could still track JWST to observe this planet. Um, so as Jupiter got closer and closer to what we call our fine guiding sensor, so the camera that we use to really point at these really, really distant, distant objects far, far away, um, if all the light from Jupiter, because it scatters light tremendously, and I'll, um, there's another image that I'll ask you to bring up in a second, 
that shows you that. So the light actually just gets spread all over the entire instrument field of view. So we wanna understand how well we can actually do science with it. And so what we did was we moved Jupiter closer and closer to that fine guiding sensor. And this is one of the images. It's actually about a minute worth of data. Um, that's how bright Jupiter is. Uh, Europa is there on the left and it's saturated already within a minute. Um, and you see Europa's shadow is actually that little black dot that's right by the great red spot. Um, so that's kind of fun, uh, but yeah. Right there, right? I got <laughs> <Yeah>. it, right? <laughs> um, I absolutely, when I first saw these images, I, like my jaw dropped. I couldn't believe how well we were able to resolve things in just a minute. Um, it wasn't overly smeared the way that I was expecting. You know, Jupiter's rotating upon its own axis. Um, it's an hour a day, right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's crazy fast. <laughs> so um, everything about this image, I was like, oh my gosh, we're totally in. We we can do all of the solar system because here's Jupiter and all of its its fantastic um, image quality. As we get to longer and longer wavelengths, it gets really hard to study Jupiter because it is so bright um, because it's warm. And so we do have another Jupiter image. It's the web web Jupiter slide. Yeah, that one. Yeah, so this is taking our mid infrared instrument. And now we just kind of did like random images around Jupiter to see how bad the scattered light is. And you can see, um, so you see that beautiful PSF structure of Jupiter kind of in that, that big star structure. But then you start seeing some of the moons, but you see that the, the PSF of Jupiter, all that scattered light, it actually smears out all the way over to this, this moon on the far right. So um, that's something we really wanted to understand uh, just because we want to do the full range of JWST capability across um, not only Jupiter and its, its rings, but all of the satellites, the new moons that we are going to discover with this observatory um, and how that applies to other planetary systems, including Saturn, Mars, um, Uranus, Neptune. So it's it's it was really cool and it was a very exciting time for me. It's, yeah. I'm raising too. my hand. You have a question. What was your question, Summer? <laughs> uh, does that mean you think we're going to find new moons around Jupiter and Saturn with JWST? There's absolutely the possibility. Um, we found lots of them with Hubble, uh, but as we get to longer and longer wavelengths, we're more sensitive to the thermal light yeah, as opposed to scattered light. light, and we think some of them are really small and cold. So being a longer wavelength with the sensitivity of JWST, we think we'll probably be able to discover new ones and huh. hopefully new rings too. Oh, cool. I was, I was going to ask, I guess I have two questions now. Um, you said PSF. What's PSF? Mike can take that one. <laughs> Mike? That's called a point spread function. Okay. When, when you look at a star image, uh, what you're actually seeing for, for most stars, you're not seeing the image of the star the actual surface of the star would be much smaller than the, than the dot that you're seeing. What you're actually seeing is the, um, the diffraction effect of the telescope itself. We also call it the blur spot. Okay. Um, you know, if your telescope was perfect, no, Im you know, no imperfections whatsoever, the smallest angle that you can see is limited by two things, the wavelength that you're looking at and the diameter of the telescope. Because the, the diameter of the telescope itself, anytime a light wave hits an edge, it ripples. And that ripple causes energy to go in a place that you don't want it to go. So you'd like, when, you're, when a telescope's working, you like all the light rays to come to a single point, right? right. To a perfect, perfect point. Well, these little ripples from the edge of the telescope take energy that's headed toward that perfect point and spread it out a little. So it blurs the image a bit. And uh, if a telescope were perfect, the smallest angle that you could see is given by a formula that, that looks like the wavelength divided by the diameter. So the smaller the wavelength, well, the smaller the, you know, the, the closer you can get to perfection. Right. But you have to divide that by the diameter. And when the diameter is very, very, very big, you can get to see very small angles. That's why earlier when Stephanie said... Um, uh, radio astronomers get great resolution. They get that by combining telescopes on different corners of the Earth. So when, when they have a, uh, a telescope whose effective diameter is that of the, uh, the diameter of the Earth, they get ridiculously great resolution. They can see ridiculously small angles. Okay. But 
when you're talking about a wavelength of two microns and a diameter of six meters, as impressive as that may be, you know, uh, I think that the smallest angle that you could really discern by by normal normal formulas is about 80 milli arc seconds, uh, approximately. And if you want to know what that li- look looks like, I think it's approximately the size of um, of a penny at three or four miles, something something wow. along those lines, right? So our resolution is good, and and the resolution is the size of the point spread function, the diameter of the blur spot. Okay. So that, that's that's how that goes. Okay. I'm not sure what I relate to more, a grain of sand held at arm's length or a penny three miles away. Like, <laughs> neither one of those things are things that I do very often, but uh, it seems really small, I guess, right? New hobby. Oh, it's, it's small. <laughs> New but, hobby. But the radio astronomers, God bless them, uh, they've imaged the black hole in the center of another galaxy. So, right. You know, we're, we're not going to be competing with that resolution. <laughs> <laughs> and my other question really quickly, and I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to hop over to that image of Jupiter again. And I wanted to ask, let me see if I can enhance the little dark spots. They're very square. Are those like dead pixels or something? Or have we discovered a lot of moons of Jupiter or dust <laughs> or something on the lens? So this was imaging <laughs> test data. Um, okay. So we, we didn't do um, dithering or any sort of imaging in the way that you would if you were trying to get science data. So detectors have defects going across them. Um, there's actually a whole patch of them that are erased from this image um, because it was such a large patch of, of dead pixels. Um, but all of those are actually dead pixels. And so we, we've, we understand what those look like across the instrument. Um, that was part of what we were doing during commissioning was seeing where they all were, mapping them out so that our software then takes into account where they are yeah. and it automatically gives them a zero out. Um, and so you won't see those kinds of dead pixels in the same sense. Um, when you're typically doing an observation or an image, what you do is you take that whole camera and you kind of, wiggle it around the image and that moves all those dead pixels around so it you end up getting the actual image Uh, Um, we weren't doing that with us like i said we were basically taking quick snapshots of jupiter as we moved it closer and closer to our our um, tracking camera and so um because it's commissioning test data it wasn't acquired as a science image and it's not quite as beautiful as some of the other ones um there are people that have been playing around with the processing of that particular data set um, online, and they've done beautiful jobs of, you know, working through some of those little dark black squares. But um, it, like, it was test data. Yeah, we it makes sense. We were told very specifically we're not supposed to science our test data, and so um, which was very very hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I figured, I mean, they were very square, so I figured they were either like, you know, pixels or very small Borg ships flying around Jupiter. I guess they'd be pretty big <laughs> Borg ships if that's the size of a Jupiter in the background. Um, but thank you for that. I, I was curious, and I hadn't actually noticed that when the image first came out, so I figured, oh, oh we have James Webb people on, let's ask James Webb people. And really quickly, if you want to understand the people in chat that we're talking to, uh, somebody made a joke earlier. Alex actually made a joke earlier. You were talking about the fingerprint of water. Right, water vapor. They're like, oh no, fingerprints on the James Webb Space Telescope lens. That would be bad. <laughs> and somebody else said, uh, Marito actually said, I understand gravitational lenses are very fingerprint resistant. So those are your viewers here today. You can go as technical as you'd like to. They're making gravitational lens fingerprint jokes in chat. That's perfect. I'm going to have to remember that one now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Summer, let's keep going here. Where's my mouse? Well, there it is. Well, we covered Jupiter, which is actually my favorite planet. But um, Stephanie, I wanted to ask you if there's a particular solar system or other object that you're dying to see the James Webb Space Telescope data slash image of. Um, before I saw the first images, my the most exciting the program I'm most excited about for the first year of observations. So we already know what all the science we're doing for the first year of JWST will be. Um, That was selected a few years ago, actually. And so everybody's already in the queue and we're working through all of that science. And we actually have to write for year two's worth of science this winter um, because proposals never die um, in the scientist's life. Um, But at any rate, the one that I was most excited about for the first year of observations is an interstellar object. 
Um, so we have a target of opportunity proposal that's been accepted. So whenever the next interstellar object is discovered, um, JWST will make every attempt to try to observe it. And it is by far the most capable facility observatory um, in and out of this world to actually study an interstellar object. Um, because of the wavelength coverage, uh, the spectroscopy that we can do, so studying all of those different fingerprints. Um, we don't think interstellar objects have any crazy fingerprint lensing problems. Um, but the instance of two that we know of interstellar objects, one of them look like an asteroid or in some circles, a, a spaceship. Um, and then a, the other one looked like a comet. So we have no idea what these objects look like as far as a population goes. And we and maybe it's dependent on where they're coming from. Um, so the more we start discovering, the more we'll learn about them. And so I'm really excited about it because it gives us sort of that one of those like, uh, you know, cookie crumbs of another planetary system that's a lot closer to home and really helps us understand how that planetary system may have formed, whether it looks like our own. Um, and so that was my most exciting thing. But now, and I'm going to put a request in to show the first image of Stefan's quartet. Um, can I just ask one quick question about the interstellar objects? Because mm -hmm. um, just for everyone's reference, that one, it, I'm not going to remember the name, but it started with the O. Oumuamua. Yeah, that there you one. Go. So that was a big one that flew through that everybody was like, what is this? Is this alien? Is this a ship? <laughs> so that is really exciting. Um, and so the you said a target of opportunity. So that just means should one of these come in, it's been approved to say time out on whatever we're doing, we're slewing the telescope yeah. to go. Back. Yeah. Um, we don't have so there's various levels of target of opportunity. Some of them it's, you know, stop everything as fast as we can and observe this object. So like if a supernova goes off, that's yeah. kind of stop everything. If a new comet or an interstellar object observed and um, detected, it takes us a little bit of time to understand um, the orbit of that object. So right. we need to get a lot of ground-based observations so that we can constrain that orbit so we can actually point web at that object because we're designed to look at tiny little stars and galaxies across the universe. And so we have very small um, fields that we can actually use the JWST to study. So if we're tracking something moving, we have to understand that orbit very, very well, um, just so that we can use our instruments on JWST to study it. So we have a couple of weeks, months, if, if we have a couple of months um, to really understand that orbit and make sure we understand how to observe it. Um, so that's that's the type of target of opportunity that object is. But then I saw Stefan's quintet, and now I think I want to be an extragalactic astronomer um, I, because this is the most amazing image. I think. Um, I, no, don't get me wrong. I love Karina; it's my favorite. But this one blew my mind as a planetary astronomer. A planetary astronomer, just because I never knew that we could see the kinds of things that you could see in this one image. Um, active galactic nuclei. So you're seeing a black hole pulling in material of a galaxy. You're seeing star formation and star destruction, galaxies merging. Um, you see beautiful stars in the image. You see that notable asterisk looking PSF um, in the upper right. You see background galaxies. Um, it, it is a fantastic image. And the amount of information that's contained in this image is, is just extraordinary and it, it absolutely blew me away so now i think i want to be an extra galactic astronomer <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm seeing agn all the way for sure yeah. um and so i think das if you um zoom out just for a quick second yeah so just to clarify isn't it the one on the left that's not actually part of this the one on the left is yeah a lot closer okay. than the ones on the right that it's, one um, so the 40 million light years away and the ones the four on the right are about 290 million light years away. Yeah, you can put an X on that one. Put now. an X <laughs> on it. Okay, all right. Not that one. Don't look at that one. It's not very cool. The other um, ones are all, they're all interacting. Yeah. Which is the coolest thing. And I love that you get to see like those, the tidal tails. Um, yeah. It, is it that... Is 
like really quickly, there are like 18 million questions that are all very good questions. Um, <laughs> but really quick, like we're going to have to do like a question speed round or something. But I, if I understand this correctly, like these are stars that are closer, right? And you can tell because they have the PSF. Did you get that right? Was that okay? I got the thumbs up. Good. Um, and the, the things that don't have that, those are galaxies that are further away. Like if you really zoom into the image and you see those things that don't have that. When you get sort of way out there, those are things that are a long way away as opposed to a star that's sort of like really close to you, right? Did, am I understanding that correctly? Yes, for the most part. For the most part. Okay, so I'm sort of understanding it incorrectly, but... <laughs> no, uh, so red can be indicative of either very, very, very far away, a galaxy far, far away, right? or it can be indicative of a lot of dust and gas. Ah. So. It really depends on the, the unique molecular signature that you're looking at or bulk signature that you're looking at for those distant objects. Um, so we're seeing a lot of things popping in and out of um, social media about, oh, we have now the most the furthest galaxy away now. Um, so a lot of that is, is going through its peer review and a lot of scrutiny because you have to have the spectra as well as the image to really prove um, that you have something pretty distant. So right. um, we'll see what comes out after peer review of what the the far, far away actually is. But um, yeah, gotcha. it's very true. It can be either very, very far away. Uh, but I think the takeaway message is, yes, those are distant galaxies. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that leads right to another question. Like, is there just like the James Webb Space Telescope fire hose that's sending all the data down and then just people like take a dip and say, wow, this is amazing. Or is it like a peer review process where nothing gets put out until everybody's looked at it and agrees at what they're seeing? How does that work? Do you want to talk about that, Mike? Mike? Well, I, I can t talk about at least the first part of it. The, the early release observations, the EROs, those first images are public. And, and people can, you know, they went out to the science community. And as Stephanie said, they weren't intended to be, they weren't intended to be science in as much as, you know, the, the, uh, the scientists that, that actually propose science have to go through a, through a process and, you know, have to be selected. But those ERO uh, observations are certainly open to the public, open to any scientists. And uh, believe me, there, there's a wealth of information in that. And as Stephanie said, when the, when the first deep field came out, uh, I, I had, uh, fortunately, Stephanie, you know, Ma Massimo Stiavelli, uh, an extra galactic astronomer, is right down the hall. So I could run to his office and say, hey, I just read that we saw a Z equal 20 galaxy, which would have been, you know, ridiculously groundbreaking. And, you know, Massimo said, ah, you better hold off on that one, Mike. We're, we're, we're still arguing about that. But all the ERO observation, all the early release observations are open to the public and open for uh, any scientist that wants to wants to study them. OK, so and Stephanie, you can take it from there. Yeah. Um, so there's there's observations that have um, no proprietary time. So things that are available immediately to the public. Um, so as Mike was saying, the early release observations all have no proprietary period now. Um, and also all the commissioning data is also available to the public. Right. Um, the first year of science, as I said, has already been planned and, and approved. And a majority of those programs, um, the scientists that proposed to do that observation gets a full year to oh. analyze their data, interpret their data and publish their data without it going out to the broader community or public. Um, a handful of those observations have actually been designed to be released immediately to the public. And this was because of the nature of how that program works. So right. if you imagine our whole first year of science, everybody got to hoard their data for a full year. As I already told you, we have to write proposals for the second year of science come this winter. And that means anybody that didn't have their hands on data for the first year of science wouldn't have any opportunity to analyze real data or look at it in any detailed way to understand what they wanted to propose for the uh. next year. So um, the director actually set aside about 500 hours worth of time on JWST for the first year 
And these are supposed to be sort of observations that happen pretty quick right. um, that will be released to the public. And so those programs are starting to happen and we're starting to get some of that data down. Um, some of them are going to take a little bit longer than others. Like uh, I, one of the questions I get routinely now is we saw TRAPPIST-1 is being observed and we want to know what those exoplanet spectra look like. Um, it takes multiple transits to beat down the signal to noise that they really want to analyze and interpret that data. But as soon as it's done, so you have to wait for the full number of transits to actually happen to complete a program, then it becomes available. And okay. so it's just going to take a little bit of time. Whereas like Jupiter, as I said, it takes a minute to like do an minute, observation yeah. of the whole planetary <laughs> system. So it's, uh, it's, it's like, and you're good. Yeah. Okay. So, so like to sort of repeat that in my own words, there's some, public observations that the data is just available when it comes down. And that's to give more people the opportunity to sort of look at it and say, oh, that's interesting. I should propose that we study that thing in more detail, right? And there's some, private is probably the wrong word, but there's some data that comes down because somebody signed up and, okay, we should do this. And everybody said, yeah, that's a great idea. We vote on that. That's what's going to be observed. And they make the schedule. But the data comes down to that group of scientists and they get it for a year before it's released out anywhere else so that they can write their papers on it or whatever. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I don't need to simplify it too much, but write their papers on it, right? Absolutely. Some, some are, you're not like, oh my gosh, this guy. Like. <laughs> that sounded exactly right. Like, okay. Uh, and I was just curious, um, so you mentioned for the first year, you have that like director time or director discretionary time. Is there like NASA director discretionary time for um, going forward or is it kind of all just proposals, but there's some withheld? Yeah, there is. So every year, the director of the observatory, which is actually at Space Telescope Science right. Institute, not at NASA, um, he gets a certain amount of time every year to hold aside. So you can't schedule X amount of hours every single year. And that's because amazing things happen that we want to observe. So there are these target of opportunity proposals where you can propose and say, when an interstellar object is discovered, we want to observe it. And that, that can or can, you know, sometimes they're approved. Um, but then every once in a while, there's something crazy that happens. A comet blows up or goes into the sun or um, a new mission is, you know, bumping into the side of a, an asteroid. And we didn't know the timing of that at whenever the proposal call um, actually happened. And so there's a program called Director's Discretionary Time, and you can write these proposals for something that's new or spectacular that's happened that wasn't anticipated when the regular proposals were happening. And so um, a lot of people go in for that kind of time. Um, there may be yeah, like I said, a comet all of a sudden has a huge outburst, but it wasn't part of a target of opportunity program or a regular comet we were going to observe. So we want to try to observe this outburst and understand what that looks like. So we'd write a discretionary time proposal. Um, maybe there's a new pulsar that's discovered and it's now interacting with something and causing some crazy phenomenon that we're seeing with ground-based telescopes. So we really want to understand that with JWST, but it's a short-lived event, so we want to do it really quick. So these are the kind, you know, you can imagine just about anything. We just, you know, um, Planet Nine's discovered, all hands on deck, let's go. And, yeah, let's go and observe it. So I'd imagine that would be it. And actually, Stephanie, I think the, um, it was the director's discretionary time that was used for the initial Hubble deep field. The, the, the director of the Space Telescope Science Institute took a risk and he and a bunch of uh, other astronomers just decided, hey, we're going to take a chance. We're going to use that time on Hubble to look at some patch in the sky with nothing in it and see what we got. And I know that, um, you know, Mark Clampin and others have told me, of, you know, that there was a lot of, um, well, I, I don't want to say dissension, but people thought that might be a crazy idea. And you see what happened. And that was, I believe that was dis director discretionary yes. time as well. Yeah. Yep. We're, yeah. we're talking about telescopes time, and there's another perfect question for this. Um, how many hours are in a year, like how many available observing hours, I guess, are available in a year for James Webb? So is it literally 365 and a quarter times 24 hours? Or are there maintenance periods that sort of yeah. wear that time away? There, there are maintenance periods. We have a requirement to be um, to to be seventy percent at, at least seventy percent efficient. 
Okay. So if you do your calculation, 360 by 24, 365 by 24, uh, we should, we have to be, uh, we have to use 70%, 70% of those hours. And so far, you know, we've had, a, we've had a couple of small growing pains, things like going into safe holds and things like that, that you're, you know, you just get with a new telescope. But right, right. For the most part, um, the efficiency, the thing that's dominant in the efficiency is to slew the telescope from place to place. Right. right? Yeah. We, we don't slew quickly because, as Stephanie said, this is a this telescope is a bit floppity. So floppity. we do that carefully. We, we 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 can slew about ninety degrees in about sixty minutes. So to go from target to target takes a little bit of time. And then once every three weeks, we have to do what we call a station keeping maneuver, just to point the thrusters to maintain the L two orbit. Those are the two biggest contributions to our uh to that 30 percent inefficiency right but for the most part 0. 0.7 times 365 pi times 24 gotcha. is what you get is it the, oh, go I ahead Summer, how, go oh i just was curious how oversubscribed where was that time like how many hmm. proposals did you get for each you know hour proposed versus how many do you know you know what i mean i'm okay. not saying but like Stephanie, I, I, I yeah, I'm trying to remember the number. Um, yeah. So it was, we think there was a little bit less of, of proposals submitted than probably will happen in future cycles because yeah. our first proposal um, deadline was during COVID. Uh, um, so it was right after the pandemic, it was the winter after. And so we think that there might've been some depletion in numbers, but I think we were still oversubscribed. Oh, um, I have no idea. This isn't being recorded, right? So. No, nobody knows. <laughs> Chat, y'all don't know, right? Everybody go like this real quick. Okay. Just... <laughs> I think it was something like eight to one. Okay. Um, yeah. I would think it was high. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I, we were expecting a little bit higher than that. Um, but again, it is the first year of operations. The it hadn't even launched yet. <laughs> right. So the People. community was still like biting their fingernails about whether or not this was actually going to happen. And then, um, and then the pandemic uh, had an impact on people's work uh, in ways that nobody really had prepared yeah. for. Yeah. So, I mean Clearly yeah. as a joke, but people are out here like, oh my gosh, there's 300 and how many points of failure? I'm not even going to bother writing a proposal until this thing's up. <laughs> and then lo and behold, it's up and it's working as advertised. And they're like, oh gosh, I guess I should write some proposals now. Um, I made that up. I'm not a scientist who sits proposals, but I think that's funny. Um, no, I, I have colleagues that absolutely said they weren't going to propose until they knew that it was launched. And that was, yeah. they were telling me that and they know I work on the project. <laughs> <laughs> like well no. gee thanks for the faith yeah I mean. thanks for the vote of confidence <laughs> jeez but Mike, you had said something that made sense to me that I hadn't thought of, like the slew time. It takes you time to look from over here and then, bzzz, I guess it doesn't make that noise, but to right. look over here, right? And when the telescope is going back and forth, y'all probably like, I guess, order the targets in such a way that you minimize the whole ping pong match of slewing the telescope back and forth, right? You go from here to here to here to here to here instead of like this. Oh, over here, over here, over here, over here. Like, is that part of the, I guess, algorithm for choosing the order of, of missions, missions, observing targets? Whichever? That's correct. That, that's part of our, our, our observation planning. Huh. Okay. And, um, and, and there are other factors that go into that. Um, one of the things is we... Um, we also want to plan our orientation so that we minimize what we call our angular momentum buildup. Right. The, the solar radiation pressure on that big sun shield, which is a humongous solar sail, right? Um, when the center of mass of our observatory is in in perfect line with the center of pressure from the solar, from, from the, um, the solar radiation, well, that means solar radiation could try to start tipping you over. Well, to keep from tipping us over, we have six flywheels, six reaction wheels. And while the solar torque may want to turn you, you know, one way, as it's trying to turn you, the wheel is spinning up in the other way so that it's keeping you steady. Well, if you were maintaining the same attitude all the time, the wheel would keep spinning up, spinning up, spinning up until it starts to go pretty fast. And then you'd say, oh, uh, let's stop. 
uh, put on the brakes for the wheel. But if you put on the brakes, you go. The observatory could try to tip over like a helicopter with only one rotor going. Uh -huh. So to to put on the brake on the wheel and slow it down, you have to fire thrusters in the opposite way to to keep you steady. Yeah. So that would be a process of what we call momentum unloading. That could be another source of inefficiency because you're not doing science. But by scheduling the, um, the, the proper sequence of observations, we can get it so that the wheels can naturally spin themselves down as you're just slowing to a, from one top, from one place to another. Okay. So that's also part of the algorithms that we use to, to um, schedule observations. So you're not just waving this thing all over the sky, looking at Jupiter and then over here, and then this thing flies by. Let's look at it real quick. Like there's a lot of thinking, a lot of planning that goes into exactly there's how thinking, you move right. the telescope. Everybody knows what he's talking right. about there, right? We can get our, we can get our exercise in real quick. If you're in a spinny chair, one of the ways the telescope actually controls which way it's pointing is like you doing this in your chair. Like if you've got a rotating chair and you sort of put yeah. your elbows up and you do the twist, you move your arms in one direction and your rear end goes in the other direction. And the telescope does the exact same thing. Like if it wants to slew into one direction, it spins a wheel faster or slower. He was saying he puts the brakes on. Literally, it's a big, massive wheel that speeds up or slows down. And just like you sort of doing the twist in your office chair, that's one way that they can spin the telescope. I mean, slew the telescope uh, in a very controlled manner, not spin it. <laughs> There's a neat little demo we do in, in when I used to teach physics yep. in some colleges. And there's a neat little demo you can do with a, Is it you the, can hold a bicycle, the bicycle wheel, wheel and yes. sit on that swivel chair. You can demonstrate a lot of these effects. Excellent. All right, Summer, another question. I've got so many questions here. Like you get one, I, I'll get eight. You get another one. <laughs> I just had a quick question going into the weeds a little bit, but hopefully the audience might appreciate it. Um, if you can't get like, depending on how precisely you've lined up those observations to minimize all the downtime, um, but you still have some time between the last object of one and getting to the first object of the next, does that time in between count against the next astronomer? Or is it downtime? So it's not until you're on well, track for the next astronomer. We've budgeted that and the, um, the long, what they call the, the long range planning tools that we use try to uh, minimize that that idle time. Right. Because you realize a lot of these observations and a lot of our slewing around happens autonomously. Ah. The, the telescope, we send up an observation plan, a sequence of observations right. about once a week. And for the most part, we're in contact with the telescope uh, right now you know, about um, uh, six hours a day, you know, somewhere between eight and six hours a day. The rest of the time, the telescope's on its own, uh, executing those moves that we told it to move to do. So if the, we, we try to minimize the amount of idle time between two observations where you're one observation is done and it's waiting for the, the right time to do the next one. But that was part of our efficiency budget to, to make right. sure that, you know, First, that, that idle time will exist. Right. And and but we've tried to to schedule things to minimize that idle time. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about an optimization issue. There, right. there are some programs where there there is an expected idle time though, and the observer does get um, dinged for that. So you can imagine if you want to watch a planet transit in front of its star, yeah. you need to be ready to go as right. that planet starts transiting in front of the star. Right. So there's a little bit of headspace that you have to give yourself as far as scheduling to make sure you're pointed and ready to go waiting for that transit to actually happen. And so um, those types of observations do get hit a little bit harder as far as the overhead that they get charged for their programs. Um, tracking an object moving in the solar system is a little bit more um, time that's acquired because now we have to point in the right spot in the sky. Then we have to find a star that we can make move at a rate that the object's moving. And that takes a little bit more time than just going to a star and just sitting and pointing on it and staring at it. Um, so there's, it depends on the program. Sometimes some of them have a lot more overhead than others. Right. Um, but as Mike was saying, most of that's already been accounted for as far as our long range plan goes. There's not a whole lot of idle time with the observatory. And if there is, that's that's a big problem for us. Right. Yeah. 
I have another good question. I have so many good questions coming from chat today. Um, every time we do one of these shows, it seems like the questions are getting better and better. Um, so we were talking about the effects of solar radiation pressure on the observatory. And uh, there was a question. There's an aft momentum flap that I think is deployed. But the aft momentum flap, is that a static structure? Or can you like use the aft momentum flap to help turn the observatory in one way or the other? It's a static structure. Okay. And, and in the early days, I'm smiling because I had to write several white papers on that. Right. Uh, we certainly did want, we certainly considered whether or not to make that thing adjustable on orbit and, right. and uh, actuators. But uh, that would have been, that would have been more single point failure. Uh, the One of the things that was um, important about that, that guided our decision was, yeah, it would have been neat to make that thing adjustable on orbit, right? OK. And if it failed and it failed in one position, ah. now all of a sudden you're conducting the rest of your mission life in a, in a, a position that's only optimal for one one attitude. Yeah. Right. One, one one pointing direction. So in the end, we opted to say, look, we will adjust that flap to put the center of pressure in line with the solar radiation in, in line with our center of mass for the median attitude, for the middle attitude of our mission. Right. And, and therefore, at that attitude, it's doing its job pretty good. And, you know, uh, and it, around those attitudes, which are probably our most prevalent attitudes, you're getting the most benefit for that. But you're not doing the risk that, you know, if I was to slew all the way over and try to adjust my flap and it froze there. Right. Well, now I have, you know, now I have a problem with, 90% of my other attitudes. So gotcha. that, it's a static, it's a static structure. And it's, it's definitely not the sort of thing where you would be like, Oh, you know, Avast, let's uh, reef the starboard sunshade. So we get more pressure on this side and we just use solar pressure to turn the observatory one way or the other. Uh, that's no. like 300 points of failure. Why don't we do f some of them a few times? They work the first time, right? Uh, nothing like that is actually. In oh, the and it, it was funny because when I had to write those white papers, I had to, uh, you know, I, I didn't uh, I knew that we had around 350 at the time, single point failures. And, you know, even before I wrote the white paper, which has very professional language. Yep. My attitude about adding another on orbit actuator was probably a little unprofessional. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, but realistic. But I, I just like the answer. <laughs> oh, Summer, do you have another one? I have um, lots. Yeah, go, go. Okay. Uh, if we were to order a 10 pack of James Webb Space Telescopes, could we get them for less each? And why don't we don't, why do we not yes. do that? Like, is that really well, a thing? Could we just uh, no, 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 build no. five um, more? First of all, in engineering, you would call that non recurring costs, right? You, you we, we've, uh, if you wanted to order a 10 pack, we could give you a 10 pack at a, <laughs> at a, at a, at a better cost. At like 5% right? less, you, right? <laughs> Well, something I don't know, but <laughs> but the the truth is, as um, as science starts to you know starts to learn new things and and come up with new priorities, the next great space telescope will probably not be in the infrared. It looks like the new science, the exoplanet stuff, and the high contrast astronomy that that uh, astronomers are looking at are probably going to be back in the visible maybe even ultraviolet and, you know, the uh, very uh, high frequency infrared regime. So if you're going to make a telescope like that, uh, James Webb probably isn't quite the design, the design. you'd like, but um, we have every, well, I have every intention of leveraging as much of the James Webb architecture as is applicable. But if I maintain 10 James Webbs, the scientists would, would, well, they think I was crazy. And I'm, <laughs> Stephanie, you take it from there. <laughs> yeah. It, well, and the added benefit that we have right now that we didn't know before launch is we now have enough fuel to operate this telescope for quite a long time. We're at a location that's um, not serviceable at the moment, and we didn't build the observatory to be serviceable mostly because of the things that Mike just said, is technology is gonna be changing at a rapid pace. Even our detectors that we have on James Webb Space Telescope right now are already becoming obsolete considering how much time it's taken since we've implemented them in their instrument and put them through our entire test phase. And 
So by the time we want to build another infrared telescope, there's going to be new technology and new things that we would want to have there anyways. And so having a duplicate of the entire observatory, maybe um, there's things that we could definitely take, as Mike was saying, as we're building the next big telescope that's likely going to deploy. Um, we have a lot of lessons learned in the engineering and how to test and things like that that will go forward for sure in future designs. But the instruments is, are probably going to look completely different. Yeah. Um, the capability, the science goals, those all might be totally altered just depending on what happens over the next five, six years um, as the next the next big thing starts getting planned and developed and organized. And we have big telescopes coming online on Earth, um, 30 meter telescopes that are going to be discovering new things. And so all kinds of technology, innovation, um, as far as instrumentation, as well as the observatory kind of class is, okay. is definitely growing and enhancing in ways that um, I don't think that we would want 10 JWSTs. <laughs> <laughs> what, an, what an interesting statement. Like, uh, it, it seems like this is always the way it goes with the big science missions, right? Maybe Mars rovers aside, because we got a couple of those. But it's like we spend all this awesome time in engineering and in money um, designing something, and we launch one, and it works. And it's like, okay, great. Now let's design something else completely, and let's go on to the next thing. And I imagine it's a huge like a tug of war well new technology comes out well let's integrate that well now you're going to push the schedule back and you'll never launch it if you keep waiting for the most recent technology but it always seems like we've designed this cool telescope eh, let's just launch three of them real quick and then we have three to look at three different places or i don't know make like james webb megatron or something where one forms the head and you can look at 14 15 billion years back i don't know but it, is it just the well, technology I, 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 like I would say this i am involved in, in in i'm starting to get involved in the planning of the next one yeah and and I do, um, as an engineer, I do share that. I don't want to call frustration, but the one thing that I have told to, to some of my colleagues is, look, we got our foot in the door. Yeah, we have a foothold. We, we put a, uh, a telescope larger than its its rocket uh, in, at the L two point. Let's, you know, uh, don't turn this into a stunt. Turn this into a. I mean, the the catchphrase that I use is. You know, I always believe in rev, uh, evolution and not revolution. So right. take the stuff that we got and evolve it and try to cut down the not, you know, tr try to leverage this to cut down non-recurring costs. The instruments will always be different. There's yep. no there's no hiding that. Yep. But elements of our architecture, I am a firm believer in reusing because I, I believe in revolution instead of a, you know, a, a, a evolution instead of a revolution on that. Yeah, that, that makes sense. That's what they did with the Mars rovers. That's why we have multiple rovers that look right. amazing. We're just upgrading the instrumentation. Right. Maybe we change the tires. Yep. Um, little wheel change. Uh, there's things that we have lessons learned, right? But um, if you have a, a, a concept that works or a good foundation, it, it only makes sense because we have these technology readiness levels that we have to meet. So every time you do a whole new design, you have to go through this whole process yep. of getting that ready for flight. And if you have something that works, that's flown and then was as beautifully successful as, as everything that operated on the JWST, why not? Why wouldn't you use that? You now have dampened your costs. You don't have a lot of um, other incremental costs that are incurring just getting to that technology readiness that um, you will need to yeah. fly. It's, it's not like you get the, yeah, the, 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 there's, there's ahead, a point that, that I want to bring up for this yeah. too. The, um, um, when we, when we engineers design something like web, something totally new, totally different, we have a, we always design and we throw in margin for unknown unknowns because we're going to, we're, we're doing an application and living in an environment that we're just not used to. Yep. You don't know what you don't well, know yet. That's right. Now, now web, and this is one of the reasons I'm kind of glad I'm staying on web, you know, uh, uh, part time because I'm going to find out how much of those unknown unknowns we really, you know, didn't know. We're going to watch how Webb performs on orbit. And even though it's certainly not an engineering mission, you know, if you go changing it, if you go changing the architecture, then you're not going to benefit from all the things that you just learned from Webb on during its mission, during its orbit. So right. once again, evolving something rather than just starting all over is, is a much better way, uh, if, you know, at the end of five years, I can look at the performance of web and how it trended and start to know how much margin, performance margin I really need for unknown unknowns. And that 
that shouldn't be underestimated because with web, when we started it 25 years ago, this was, this was no one, we had nothing to, you know, nothing to leverage. We, this was never been done before. Right. And we didn't know how much margin we needed for certain key parameters. We just did our best. So um, keeping, you know, uh, keeping elements of the web design for a future mission comes with some real advantages. Yeah. It's like I keep my same uh, chassis down here with my computer, but I put a new graphics card in it. You know, I mean, you know, I joke, but that's sort of you get yeah, new no, instruments, no, no, that's, new tech. Uh, yeah. New technology advances and all the things that we do. Um, that makes sense that there could be upgraded versions. A lot of the physical things we learned, we know now. And let's leverage some of that and put some new new tech in it. Um there's no way we'll get through all these questions. I think I'm going to try to speed run some because we have like five minutes left. Um, cool. Summer, any any hanging things that you were dying to ask before I go through a speed run sort of deal here? Well, I have one that's slightly off topic, but silly, but also highlights how astronomers and engineers are humans too. So Mike, I know that you also do like powerlifting and things like that. And so I was wondering- Are you still- Oh, okay. Well, I was going to ask you, what's the largest component of JWST that you could power lift? <laughs> oh, that I can power lift. <laughs> well, okay. When, uh, as a younger man, uh, I used to compete and I'd do about 330 pounds on a bench press and I weighed 165. Those are, uh, I, I, I can't really tell you, but I do know this. Uh, during the development of James Webb, when people, when we were having a, a lot of mass problems, people would be coming into my office saying they need more masses, need more mass. And I was so, <laughs> I, I got to the point where like, okay, you want the how much mass? If you can pick that up with your little finger, we'll, we'll talk about it. If you can't pick it up with your little finger, you can just march out of my office because that ain't going to happen. <laughs> it's like the feats of strength so, to get mass on your instruments. Like if you can pick this off the desk, you can put it on the telescope. And he has like a five foot block of tungsten on the desk. Or something. There, there, there was, there was a, a, I guess one point, one of the mass crises we had, and they always seemed to hit on a Friday at five o'clock. Of course. Where we were over mass by about 400 kilograms. So that's about, you know, uh, over 800 pounds. Right. And at the time, Stephanie, I don't know whether you were on the program or not at the, at the time, we were going to not fly a cryo cooler. We were going to fly a, uh, a Dewar, which was a big thermos, uh -huh. like a big thermos bottle with a lot of, uh, a lot of, you know, liquid, uh, actually it might have even been liquid uh, hydrogen. Yeah. Well, that was weighing 400 kilograms. And right after I heard about my problem, I called up Lee Feinberg. I alluded to Lee earlier and I said, hey, Lee, the uh, the doer just became came a cryo cooler, regardless of what anyone says about it. So um, I suppose uh, I'd have to. That's a good question. I have to look it up, but I can lift 300 pounds on a bench press. So that'd be about 150 kilograms. And I'll have to look up what that what what component is. Is that, is that. <laughs> you go. Is that you... like a wing? Because each mirror is what, about 50? Each mirror is about 28 kilograms, each PMSA. I could lift those up. You wouldn't yeah. let me, but I could so probably I'm thinking a whole it. wing structure. When <laughs> 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 okay. I mean, you include the back plane in there, that might be a wing. Huh. That well, might be a wing. Long story yeah. short, if you have an engineer who's deciding what can and can't go on the spacecraft based on whether or not he can bench press it, you want Mike, not me. <laughs> like, yeah. well, well, the other thing is I'm, I'm half a criminal, so uh, th th there was a point where... Um, uh, Marsha Riki, one of the sci or one of our chief scientists, I told her, "Hey, Marsha, if you give me ten minutes of observing time, uh, ten minutes of your observing time, I'll give you five kilograms." <laughs> so I was trying to parlay. I was trying to parlay a little bit of observing time into that. <laughs> oh, jeez. Um, let's end on this one because we're we're up to the end of the show here. Uh, a lot of people have asked what y'all are excited to have James Webb look at. So we're going to look at Pluto. We're going to look for something unknown. We're going to look at a dark hole in the sky and just see what's there. Uh, so Stephanie, let's go with you first. What are you excited for James Webb specifically to look at here coming up? Oh, upcoming. Yes. All right. Besides the interstellar object. Um, I think one of the most exciting things that I um, have slated coming up in the very near future is we're going to be looking at one of Saturn's biggest moons, Europa. 
Um, and we're trying to actually observe the plumes. It's so got the yeah. ocean underneath of the surface. And every once in a while, it spews out some gas. Um, we've been lucky to catch that with the Hubble Space Telescope a few times. Um, so we're hoping to catch it with the JWST. And even if we don't see the plume itself, we'll be able to see whether or not it like puts any residue on the surface. So like lava spilling over, if you thought of one of our own volcanoes. Oh. So we'll be looking and studying Europa, not only this year, but for future years, just in case we don't catch that plume to understand if anything's changing across the surface. Okay. Yeah. We've seen the imagery of Europa with like the geysers coming off of it. Yeah, yeah. That'd be awesome to see with James Webb. Mike, how about you? I, uh, you know, when I wanted to be an astronomer, I was interested in cosmology. And when, when I started on this job, it was called the first light machine. And that's what I really, I want to see the deep fields. And, uh, you know, I, the, when we did the early engineering on this, uh, it was engineered to see that the, the faintest objects there are to see, and those things are going to be around a nano Jansky. And, and, and I try to, when I give talks on this, I put that in perspective, um, you know, I can tell you what a nano Jansky is. I don't know is, what a nano Jansky is. I could Google know, it, though. <laughs> well, I can demonstrate it for you. Um, if you take a child's nightlight, that puts about, a, about five watts. Right. Put it on the surface of the moon and look at it from the Earth. That's 20 nano Jansky. <laughs> nano Jansky so okay. So to be able to see the first light, you know, the, these first galaxies, means a lot to myself and my team because that means that we engineered James Webb to do exactly what it was you know, what, what it was first designed to do, to see the, the very first light that turned on. So I'm, I'm dying to see the, the deep fields. Very cool. Very cool. Summer, do you have one? Well, I'm going to have to go with just like more AGN because I'm a big fan of multi-wavelength astronomy. And so you'll never get the full picture. So if we're getting the infrared from James Webb, the very best infrared, because the last infrared, you know, um, Spitzer, uh, this is going to be like, heads and shoulders above. So it's just gonna tell us even more about that piece of the puzzle. And then we also have to get the optical and the radio and the X-ray. But AGN, like I said, team AGN all the way. So super massive black holes at the center of galaxies. There you go. All right. Well, y'all, there's so many questions that come through. I tried to mix a lot of the questions up there. A lot of your questions were answered just as they were talking. Um, so if I didn't say specifically exactly the, quest, the the text of your question, doesn't mean they didn't answer it. Quite a few questions there were answered just over the course of our conversation. But that is going to... I actually had to look at my schedule to make sure I wasn't messing up the time. It is time for the show to end, right? It feels like it is not time yet. Wow, it flew. It flew. It completely flew by uh, like it always does here. But it is actually the end of the show. I double-checked it against the schedule. Um, so that will be it for today's Virtual Astronomy Live here with Intrepid Museum. Mike, Stephanie, thank you so much for taking time out of your weekend to spend with us here today. It was fantastic to hear from you. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. Excellent. Thank you. Yep. And uh, Mike, I, I promised I would do it. Uh, if you squint hard enough, that wallpaper there in the background looks like it could be part of a deep field there. So I could see why you're, it's like a deep field. I'll tell in... my sister all that because she'll be very happy. She was, uh, don't diss her wallpaper. <laughs> it's like a negative image right sort here. of deal, right? She's ready. She's, ready, so. She's going to okay. close the laptop and like end the show if we say anything about the wallpaper. Um, but I'll no. Let you say it's nice. <laughs> It's very nice, and we're lucky to have it on the show. Thank you so much for using it as a background today. You hear that, Anna? You hear that? <laughs> there you go. Um, no, but but really, Stephanie and Mike, thank you so much for taking time out of your weekend, sharing your insights, your expertise, all your experience, working on James Webb, talking about some of the image and the detail that we got into on some of those things. It was really something that's uh, hard for us to get anywhere else, especially live where we can answer, ask questions to people who actually know the answers. Um, just thank you so much for the time today. Summer as well. Always fantastic to have Summer oh. Ash here, too. But that is going to bring us to the end of the show, though, y'all. Remember... We do these every single month, and they're made possible through a NASA cooperative agreement. I'm not going to show it to you on the screen this time. Awarded to the New York Space Grant Consortium. We've got another one coming up next month as well, but it will it will be less virtual next month. I'm actually going out to the Intrepid Museum, and we are going to talk Apollo 13 with Fred Hayes. So we'll be out there on the Intrepid itself as part of that real live astronomy night. No virtual there, but we will be planning on streaming it so you can catch us next month. That one's actually going to be not on a Sunday 
Sunday. That one's coming up on September 30th, which is a Friday. So if you're interested in that, make sure you follow the channel, whichever one you're watching on, like and subscribe, whatever the kids are doing these days. Uh, you know how to get back to these sorts of shows if you like them. But one more time, everybody, Mike, Stephanie, Summer, thank you so much for joining us today, and we will see you nerds later. I'll roll the outro music for the people who moved, missed it at the beginning there. We can all like awkwardly wave or something. I didn't brief, any, brief anybody on this, but uh, that's sort of what happens next. <laughs> we'll see y'all later. Thank you so much. <laughs>